Okay, hello everyone, good evening. My name is Franklin. I'm one of the two co-founders of NorCal SCI. Welcome to tonight's presentation on exploring whole body participation after paralysis featuring uh, no, none other than Stephanie Cambello. Uh, we have a great event uh, for you. Uh, Stephanie is gonna be doing a very sort of engaging program uh, tonight. Uh, she'll be lecturing for about 20 minutes and then after that, she'll uh, get down and dirty and uh, get you all uh, sort of working either in your chairs or in your bed or on the floor. Uh, wherever you are, she'll uh, have you engaged. So let me uh, do a couple of housekeeping items first. Uh, everyone has been muted uh, as usual so that we could eliminate any background distractions. Uh, if you have any questions that you want to pose to Stephanie, uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end. Her presentation is gonna be about 45 minutes or so long. And so we'll have about 10, 15 minutes at the end uh, dedicated for your questions. So just feed them to me through your chat feature um, on your screen and uh, I'll pose those questions to Stephanie at the end. The second thing is, uh, as usual, we record all of these presentations for your enjoyment, should you need to jump off or be distracted by something during the course of the presentation. So uh, we'll send every uh, all the recordings out to all the register registered participants uh, by Monday and that way you could uh, enjoy it or share it with others that uh, may also benefit from tonight's presentation. So uh, that's everything that I wanted to say. And also just one last uh, kind of a plug that these kinds of events and presentations are made possible because we received a generous grant from the Reeve Foundation. So we're grateful to them. And we are also grateful to Stephanie for making herself available. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce Stephanie. She has engaged in over 20,000 hours. Yes, believe it or not, 20,000 hours working directly with individuals with a neurological disorder since 2011. She has a BS degree in exercise biology from University of California and was first introduced to Pilates in 2014 and quickly transitioned to this new model, starting a Pilates-based SCI recovery program in 2015 at the Absolute Center in Lafayette. Stephanie is a Pilates Method Alliance nationally certified Pilates teacher through Balanced Body, as well as an American Council on Exercise Professional uh, uh, Formal Education, sorry, uh, Pilates and other mindful movement modalities with neurological science to provide an intuitive hands-on style of teaching focused on body reconnection. She is also the co-founder of Zebrafish Neuro and along with her fellow co-founder Theo St. Francis. They published a 300 page book earlier this year called From the Ground Up, The Human Powered Framework for Spinal Cord Injury Recovery, which I'm sure she'll be talking about towards the latter part of her presentation. So without further ado, uh, I'll turn things over to Stephanie and thanks for joining us. Hi guys, uh, thanks for showing up tonight. Uh, I know this is a different kind of um, topic than we've done in the past, so uh, I welcome you and, I, and I'm and i excited that you guys are here. As my, uh, Franklin mentioned, my name is Stephanie and I'm one of the partners of Zebrafish Neuro. Um, we created an organization, uh, Theo St. Francis and I created Zebrafish Neuro in an effort to provide educational resources for the spinal cord injured community, both uh, SCI athletes and SCI trainers. So I wanted to just recognize quickly Theo because he's gonna be uh, in a lot of the images used in the PowerPoint slides tonight. So I just wanted to recognize him and um, introduce him as well. I'm gonna screen share now and get us going on our PowerPoint here. So tonight's topic is whole body participation after paralysis. Oh, there's my name. And I just wanna say up front, we will be working on the floor today. So um, if this is for you, awesome, great, it's here. Uh, I believe so fundamentally in floor-based movement, that unconstrained, unsupported, self-generated movement. And so I would be remiss if I went through all six of these presentations and I didn't do at least one uh, working on floor-based movement. So here it is today for those of you who are interested in starting a floor-based practice or for those of you who are continuing your journey using floor-based movements, uh, here it is today. With that being said, you can um, still observe and learn the concepts from your wheelchair or your chair or your bed. Um, again, 
these these presentations, if you guys haven't um, attended or watched the ones in, in the previous months, I'm here to give you concepts that then you can build into your uh, exercise routine and work with your body. All right. So I kind of give you these general concepts and then I have you take it and use it how you can apply it for, for your situation. All right. Uh, with that, whoops, next. Oops. With that being said, be responsible for your participation. As always, uh, you guys know, make sure that you have a space, safe space around you to work with. All right. So again, tonight's presentation, whole body uh, participation, participation after paralysis. Um, I feel like, oh yeah, here. And what I mean by this is with well-cued and well-intentioned execution of exercises, we can have a greater integration of the body, even, even um, after paralysis. And so I just wanted to address the elephant in the room. Uh, maybe some of you are thinking, Steph, I'm paralyzed. Like, don't you get it? Like there's some parts of my body that don't work. How can I have participation of areas that don't work? So um, that's what we're talking about today is how we can give you just a little bit more integration in your body um, and uh, working with that. So um, let's just put this hypothetical situation. Uh, if you are doing your exercises now or you're moving throughout your day uh, without using or thinking about your trunk or your hips or your legs or your feet, you are going to be able to have a certain amount of functional capacity at your disposal. okay? Essentially, the parts that you are not using in your day-to-day -day are living in your home, but not paying rent. So they're not contributing to the efficiency and the ease of your life. So what I want you guys and what we're gonna talk about today is how you can increase the, these areas, how you can get them to participate a little bit more, 10%, 5%, or even just 1%. And if we say 1% um, more involvement of these areas might mean just thinking about them, just trying to create some sort of awareness and connection to these areas, that's your 1%, then 1% is better than 0%. 1% is more than 0%. We can all agree with that. And so if you think about it, maybe 1% more integration is all you need to get you over the hump of a currently challenging movement. So if you have, um, if you're challenged in your transfers right now, for example, potentially 1% more integration of your trunk, your hips, your lower body, or your feet could help you actually make the transfer happen and, or be the difference between making the transfer happen and, make, and not making the transfer happen. So I just wanna take uh, an opportunity right here to tell you a story that Theo um, shared with me a while back when we were putting together all of this information. And he said to me, he said, you know, if I were to only use my upper body, there is no way I would be able to transfer. There's no way. And so I decided, so he decided, I decided that if I wanted to be able to transfer, I had to use more of my body. Okay. And he didn't really know what, we didn't know what that meant yet, but we said we needed to use more of the body. Okay. So once we started integrating the system a little bit more in Theo's body, that gave him the 1%, the 5%, the 10% to be able to do some of these things that if he only uses upper body, he wouldn't be able to do unless he integrated. So I encourage you to not underestimate the power of the extra 1% integration. Okay, so today my goal is to help you guys achieve at least that 1% and some, for some of you, it may be a little bit more. This is not, uh... all right. So again, here's the topic, whole body participation after paralysis, well-intentioned execution of exercises. So what do we need by, what do we mean by intention? So we talked about intention in the very first presentation of this uh, series, we talked about, it's not about what exercises you do, it's how you do them, okay? Usually I'll cue this with my SCI athletes, I'll ask them to think about X, Y, Z try pushing off X, Y, Z. Sense this on the bottom of your foot. Consider driving through your heel in this movement. And 
Again, that's the 1%. We think about, we try, we sense, and we consider. And if it actually manifests in something, awesome. But the 1% gets you started, okay? The 1% of thinking about it gets you started. Again, intention does not always yield a grossly large movement. That is the goal, but it does change how we perceive our participation. And that's how we get started. That's how you build awareness, connection, and participation of the whole body. This presentation, the topic that I chose today, I was kind of joking with Franklin as we were putting together the um, topic. I said, Franklin, this is a riskier presentation. It's, it's got more advanced movement concepts in it. And then it's also more advanced physical movement as well. So just kind of this disclosure, um, they are more advanced. So if you get lost, actually, Rachel on Saturday is going to do a really great parallel to the same topic. So I think between the two of them, you'll be able to see the concepts clear. Um, and then I also want to remind you, even though we are working on the floor, you can still apply these concepts to all your workout classes, your day to day movements, things like that. Okay. So um, let's just kind of move away from intention and integration for a second and just talk about some basic physics stuff. Why is it so hard after paralysis or after spinal cord injury to generate power, generate force, or even lift an arm for some of us, all right? So um, basic physics, Newton's second law says that if a force is applied to us, and we do not meet that force with some sort of stability or, um, or, or force back on it, then we're just gonna get shoved around. And Theo, I'm sorry, I probably butchered that, but that's the basic idea here. So if a force comes onto us and we're not able to accept or stabilize against that force, then we're gonna kind of get shoved around. So some of you guys may know this, if you use a manual chair and you try to push over a heavy door and you don't stabilize in your chair or have your brakes on, instead of pushing the door open, you are gonna get pushed back, right? Same thing, if you try to lift something off of the floor and you're not holding on to the side or your, your seatbelt's not on, there's a potential that instead of moving the object up to you, you will move down to the floor, okay? Even, even you know, peeling the layers back a little bit more, if you were to lift up your arm out to the side, for some of you, that is enough force to tip you over. And so your body's either gonna naturally grab onto the other side, hook on the handle when you lift your arm, or you'll lean away from it so that the force doesn't pull you over, okay? I know this is like super, super fit, uh, simple physics, but we have to understand this concept. It's so fundamental, this concept for the topic that we're gonna get into, which is that full body integration. Let's see. So not only considering forces that are external, but also considering forces that are, are our own body. So um, in order for us to generate force then, or create movement without getting shoved around or tipping over out of the chair, we need to have some sort of stability, okay? Immediately we think, okay, some external stabilization things might be support of the wheelchair. So the back of your chair when you're pushing a manual chair or the laterals on the side of your chair, a seat belt, a chest strap, that would be external stabilization so that you can go about your day and move your arms and not fall out of the chair. Being strapped into an exercise machine. If you guys have ever tried doing um, a rowing exercise seated, if the force that you're pulling exceeds your ability to stabilize, you will get pulled forward. And so sometimes you might strap yourself into the back of a chair or something so that you can do the row. You might hold on to something so that you can complete the task, all right? So all of this external stabilization is great. It gets us being, it, it helps us be productive people and getting our tasks done. But if we're looking to improve our movement efficiency, you wanna to look to internal stabilization and internal support. And that asks for some muscle activation or that 1% that we were talking about. And more specifically, this talks about pre-firing. So before you go to move or exert force, you have this pre, this moment before, right before to stabilize so that you can create that force or create that movement. Okay. 
Am I good? We're following along. I told you a little bit more advanced thinking today. Um, all right, so that's the pre-firing. So really we're getting to this idea of stability for mobility. And I think this is a pretty common phrase that we hear a lot, but I'll, this is essentially what we're getting at today. How can one part of your body stabilize to support movement in another area? And this would also be full integration, right? So if you're one part of your body is stabilizing to help move the other part of the body that's getting lots of systems and lots of parts of your bodies to integrate together. Again, even if it's just 1% more support. So what's awesome about that is that there is a lady, not me, who already studied these patterns in individuals with paralysis. Uh, her name is Ermgard Bartinia. She was a physical therapist in the mid 1900s. She worked, I don't know how much she worked with spinal cord injury, but she did work with polio patients. Um, so basically she created a system to describe and teach uh, these movement patterns, these patterns of support to those who lacked supported movement patterns. So people that weren't finding ways to create stabilization inside their own body, she found ways to kind of um, create a system and teach that. So um, one of the reasons her system really jumped out at me was because uh, first she recognized upper body movement lacking lower body support, which when I first heard that or read that in her book, I said, wow, this is, this is literally spinal cord injury, right? So like upper body, there's upper body um, movement going on, but there's not a lot of lower body contribution. And so um, immediately I was drawn. I said, okay, what else does this lady have to say? So this is an example of how Theo decided to integrate more of his body so that he would be able to transfer where the lower body supports movement of the upper body. Okay. Um, I hear all the time, how is, you know, how does Theo do what he does? How, he's so strong, all this stuff. Theo is strong, but the reason why he's strong is because he's learned how to integrate. Okay. Another example is, um, sit to stands or pull to stands. So um, if you do any sort of standing movement, you may be pulling on your uh, upper body um, to help push through the legs. So this is where your upper body supports the lower body. So um, as I'm showing you these examples, you're starting to recognize, oh yeah, I see how one part of the body supports activation and movement in the other part of the body. So Ermgar Bartinia, uh, started with the upper and lower halves, but then she, um, with the help of her students, systemized six patterns, fundamental patterns of total body connectivity, she called them. And they start with breath and increase in complexity as you move down. And you can look at her fundamental patterns as, um, as sort of like a video game. So in order to get to the, you have to unlock the level before you can like go to the next level. Um, you, it's not so rigid that you have to, you know, graduate from one to get to the other, but the idea is that they build on each other. And Rachel, as I said on Saturday, is going to talk about this as well in a different context, but this will be a nice introduction for you. So the first pattern is breath. You need breath to be alive, so that makes sense. Everyone's here living and breathing, so all of us are gonna be able to do level one, unlock. <laughs> level two is core distal. It talks about how you can have trunk support, core support to move your limbs. So how can you stabilize from your trunk to reach out your arm and grab you know, the cereal off the, off the shelf? Head tail talks about uh, the length of the spine, the spine and pelvis. We talked about head tail quite a bit in the last couple presentations or the second and third presentation we did on posture. So we've already done some of this stuff. Upper lower, we just talked about uh, the upper supporting the lower and the lower supporting the upper. Body half is your right and left sides. So you can think about anything that's going um, right versus left. And cross lateral is on your diagonal, reciprocal. So think crawling, walking, anything that asks for a diagonal relationship. Um, so I talked, so 
Ermgard didn't call these relationships. She called them fundamental patterns. But to me, they're just relationships. How can one support and interact with the other? Um, and if this slide was confusing to you, let's just boil it down to this. It's just how does one part of your body push in order to support a reach? Or how does one party, uh, part of your body push off so that you can reach? And how does one reach support uh, a press off? So um, these cues are gonna come out of my mouth a lot once we get on the floor. Push to pull, press off to reach. We're gonna go through a few of the exercises. I just diagrammed them because when we get on the floor, it's kind of hard to see. Um, and if you're a visual learner, this might be helpful for your, helping you feel it in the body. So a super um, basic rolling pattern um, has lots of elements in it, but I'm just highlighting two. There's body half, which is where you see um, the gray line. Um, Theo is pushing off of one side and reaching with the other hand. So that's right and left. He's pushing off with the left hand and reaching with the right hand. The cross lateral diagonal pattern, um, he's also pushing with the knee. So that's the white line. He's pushing off his knee to reach with the arm. So you can see that the patterns layer on one another. They, they progress, they build, but then they also layer in. So even within one exercise, you can think about it in many, many different ways. Cropped reaching, this would be another body half pattern where you're pushing off of one elbow to reach. You can also consider this when you're um, in your chair and you're bend, you know, leaning over uh, on the table to, to support your reach. Seated reaching, this is the core distal pattern, finding strength in your trunk and posture in order to reach forward without falling over. Head tail pattern, we talked about this in your upright posture. Um, we talked about in those lectures how important the orientation of the pelvis is in posture. And so there's that um, head tail relationship, how the, the pelvis interacts and changes um, the experience in the spine and head. And then crawling and gait. Um, so this ca crawling and gait are very complex patterns. They have all of the fundamental patterns in them, but um, just highlighting cross lateral diagonal pattern here. Yeah, there's lots of arrows going everywhere. <laughs> um, but the relationship between the right and the left sides on the diagonal, you get push off and reach and all that. So um, again, this is the visual representation. We're gonna experience this uh, on the floor. So it comes down to just how can you create a supported movement pattern and that will better integrate your body, even if it's just 1% more integration, right? I just wanted to flash those up there one more time before I turn off the slides and we're gonna come onto the floor. So if you guys uh, need to transfer down, if you need a moment to transfer down to the floor, if you're participating, if you guys turn on your videos and uh, aim the camera at me, I can help you help guide you too if you get stuck. Cause I'm gonna, I have you guys on my big TV monitor screen so I can see you guys if you want some help, okay? So go ahead and um, transfer down to the floor. Make sure you have a clear space. And if you guys are doing this from a chair, um, if you have a recline, um, a recline option on your chair, you can start with it reclined. And I'm also gonna bring you guys down a little bit. All right. So we're gonna start on our back. And this one everyone can do, because remember the first one is breath. So find a comfortable position. You can have your knees bent, legs out, pillow underneath, find something that feels right for you. And just let yourself breathe for a moment. You can close your eyes if that feels right. I'm gonna give some people an opportunity to come down to the floor too. And as you're breathing, I want you to notice where your air enters the body, how it enters the nose or the mouth, hopefully one of those two, maybe the throat. Notice the quality of its entrance 
there's resistance, maybe you're congested or you have asthma, just noticing where the air fills in your body. Does it fill in your chest, in your back, your ribs, your belly, your hips, your feet? And then how long do you feel like you can hold that air before you feel like you need to exhale? And how long you can, you feel like you can be uh, empty before you need to take the next inhale, that vacation phase. There you go, that's breath. You did it, unlocked level one. So now we're gonna use your breath to support the rest of the movements that we're gonna do today because breath is your prerequisite for everything else down that list. So right here, we're gonna take an inhale and reach your arms as far away from your body as possible. Inhale, and then exhale. Pull your arms in as close as they can to your heart, okay? Inhale, expand out. And then exhale, pull in. For those of you that have access to your legs, you can do the same thing with the legs. Expand out through all of your limbs. This is your core distal pattern. Expand out, inhale. Draw the knees and the arms in. Exhale. Good. Inhale, open out really big. Make yourself as large as possible, the biggest footprint you can. And then exhale, draw all of your limbs or as many limbs as you can into your home space here. We're gonna do that two more times. Inhale out wide. Good, and then exhale, draw in. Last one, inhale. And exhale. Good. And then go ahead and let your limbs just lay flat. We're gonna explore the head tail pattern now. So that's the relationship between your head and your sacrum or as far down the spine that you can experience. So right here, looking straight up towards the ceiling, press your head into the mat and draw your spine off the floor as much as possible. And then lower your spine down to the mat Draw your chin towards your chest and press as much of your spine down into the floor as possible. Extend off the floor and then drop into the floor. And if you're not on the floor, you're using the back of your chair. Extend, this is your head tail connectivity and all of the posture work that we've done in the past. And then exhale, draw in. So there's your breath pattern again. Inhale, expand. Exhale, draw in one more time, just like that. Inhale and exhale. Beautiful. Next is your body halves. Uh, we're gonna skip head, uh, upper lower. Your body halves are your right and left. So we're gonna slide our body into a side bend. Try to curl your spine as much as you can to the side and then bring yourself over to the other side. Mm -hmm. That's the basic idea. Now let's uh, bring in the intention of push pull. So as I pull to one side, I'm pushing off of the other side. And then you push off to slide over and you push off to slide over. A lot of times I'll have my, um, my students do this uh, wearing like a long sleeve shirt and we'll do it on a hardwood floor so it's really slippery. And you can move a little bit more free rather than on carpet. Yeah, so there's your side body, your right and left halves. Good, and we'll do that one more time. Push off to pull, push off to pull. Last one here we're gonna do in supine and then we're moving up. Little X roll or your cross body diagonal pattern. You're gonna take one arm up towards the ceiling 
We'll cross the body over. Now we're reaching with this arm and pushing from this opposite lower body because diagonal requires upper body and lower body support, which we've already done because we've unlocked the levels, remember? So you're gonna push through the leg and reach over and then rolling back down. And we're just gonna alternate sides. Reach the arm up. You're gonna push through as much intention as you can, even that 1%. We go up and over, reach, and then return. Ooh, nice. Now, if you guys have hardware going on, just be mindful of the hardware. Anytime you're doing rotation, be mindful of your hardware. You guys know that. And then bring it back. Good. Push, push, reach, and return. Now we saw in that example earlier that diagonal patterns also have a lateral component to it. So as you reach over the top, push from this side and maybe you can even get on your elbow and then come back. That would be more advanced. I'm adding options for those of you that want it. Yes, exhale, reach, push off the elbow. Nice, last one to the other side. Lovely. Let's go ahead and roll onto your side fully. We can take that roll and bring us to our side. Tuck your knees in. You can make a pillow here. Laying on your side, you're automatically in body half pattern because you have a right situation going on and a bot and a left situation or right, right, left. All right. From here, we're going to do a telescope, which is reaching the arm forward. We pull across the body and rotate open behind you. That's the gross movement pattern. Now let's add the intention. As you reach forward, you're sort of pushing with the other side to get you more rotation. And as you open up, you're pushing off that elbow to bring you open behind you, okay? Slide forward, reach open. Now, is there another pattern in this that you can identify? Diagonals. I'm gonna push through my bottom leg to help me open out. And I know I've got a student here today, we're working on this in the studio, where you push through the bottom to rotate open in the top. Okay, last one. Lovely. Go ahead and bring your arms up overhead. For arrow, this is full side body this time. We're gonna try as best as we can to fold our waistline up off the floor and then roll back down. So we're gonna be pushing from the hip and the shoulder to reach with the top rib. Push down to reach and then return. Nice. I see you guys in the videos. Nice work. Push down to reach. Push down to reach. That's really all it is, guys. It's pushing to reaching, pressing off to pull in different orientations of the body. Lovely. All right, we have to do the other side. I'm going to spin my body around, but you guys can just roll to the other side. Don't want to be uneven here. We're going to go with the pin, uh, sorry, the telescope first. So reaching forward, letting your body roll forward. Now you have an opportunity to push through this whole bottom side to open out behind you. And then bring it back forward. Push through your whole bottom side to rotate open and then bring it back. Nice. And then as you guys are working through that, you get the basic idea and then you say, okay, how can I pull with my hip too to open up and then return? Sliding and pulling with your hip. Good, we'll do one more. 
and then bring it in. Bring your arms up overhead. Can you balance? If you're able to straighten out the legs, straighten out the legs and balance on that one side. All right, you're already in body half here again by balancing through the one side and then you're able to have free movement on this side. All right, lift your waistline up off the mats by pressing down into the floor with your hip and shoulder and reach the ribs up and then relax. Good. Push down to lift the ribs and then return. There it is, your body half. You get a little oblique work. This body half work, I mentioned it just briefly before in the crawling and gait slide. Lateral stability is so imperative for gait. So if that's one of your goals, lateral stability, body half work is, is on your list. Super important. Last one. Excellent. We're gonna roll onto your stomach. If you've got super pubic cats, catheters, things to worry about, obviously. Be, be mindful there. All right, so uh, prone or on your stomach is a really great place to work on head tail connectivity um, and spinal extension. Um, if you think about babies and their motor development pattern, you have them do tummy time so that they strengthen their backs. So we can do the same here. Um, it's just orienting your body to gravity uh, and then having the muscles work against gravity. So if you start with your head on your hands and then still, still looking at the ground, float your head and chest just up off the floor just a little bit and then bring it back down. And then go ahead and float and then back down. And then as you lift up, Start to feel your head reaching on a diagonal and maybe you can sense your feet reaching out behind you or even your tail reaching out behind you. So there's a reach this way and a stabilization or an anchoring down below. One more time, lift and then release. We're going to come up um, onto your elbows next. Let's do a side body movement where you're going to push off one side and rotate to look at your foot down that one side. And then bring it back. And then same thing, we're just going to side bend to the other side. And look at your foot. There's your side body movement here. Good. If you have the ability to bring the legs into the movement, as you look towards your side, you're going to pull your knee up and then bring it back down. So I'll show it on this side with the camera side. Pull the knee up and bring it back down. So there's a pulling through one side and a pushing from the other side. Yes, nice. Good. You can also reach down and help pull your knee up this way and push it back out. Reach around, pull the leg up, and then return. Yeah. And then we get into almost this crawling pattern, isn't it? It's like kind of a pre-crawling pattern. Interesting. Part of the motor development progression. Yeah. From here, we're going to take that reptile. It's called reptile, or I call it reptile. We're going to pull the leg up. So let's have everyone get here. I call this a push to sit. And so we're going to be pushing through the upper half in order to get your lower half down. Okay, so there's a push from the hands, but then the hips are going to reach that way. If you need help with the legs, it'll look something like this. We're going to pull the leg in, push off, and then bring yourself to sit. And then we'll come back out and we'll reset. You can switch sides in doing this. I know some of you are going to take a little bit longer than others, so just take your time. Look something like this again. We're going to pull the leg up, draw the leg through, 
I'm gonna pause here for a second and just show. We're gonna reach the sit bones, reach your pelvis that way. That's the reach and the push comes from the arm and draw yourself up. And of course, I know I make it look easy. Everyone's different. Bring it back down. I'm gonna give you guys like two, maybe two more tries there. See what you can do. There's a lot of elements with that. There's a half body. You see the rib lift there? We practice that with this. Do you see how they build? Yeah, make sure you did both sides. Do one more. Make sure you're breathing. Thanks. Now we're seated. Another opportunity for head tail. Go ahead and bring your hands back behind you. Push to the ground and lift your chest. Think about sticking your tail out as well. So you get full extension from the back of your head all the way down to your pelvis. And then let yourself sink in. So as I mentioned, you guys, the exercises progress and build on each other. Some of you guys are gonna wanna stay with some of the more foundational movements. They're gonna just get, um, more and more advanced as we go, okay? So I know some of you are still with me. I know some of you guys are still hanging out um, down with the other exercises. Drop down and then push. Yes, drop down and then push. Yeah. And reach. So you're working on reaching through the crown of the head and pushing the tail out down into the floor. You root the tail and the hips down so that you can grow taller from the crown. I know some of you guys just got to see this. So I'm gonna give you a couple more uh, reps here. I like seeing the video, you guys. You're doing great. Should feel nice. And you can pair that breath pattern, right? Inhale, exhale. One more time. All right. I'm gonna give just one exercise in quadruped position for those of you that wanna experience that and explore that. If you guys aren't in the quadruped realm yet, choose one of the exercises that we just did and revisit it. Maybe the push to sit, maybe on your stomach. All right. Anything that you feel uh, you wanna revisit. So if we're going into quadruped, we're gonna roll the knees through. Here's another push. There's a push from the ground, reach with the arm. And then return back. Let's work on that transition. Push from the ground, reach with the arm. And then return. Try the other side. I'm gonna stay facing this way, but try the other side. Push from the ground, reach with the arm. There you go, Marina, you're almost there. Give me a good one. <laughs> Push from the ground and reach. Ugh. Nice one. Good job. One more time. Push and reach. Ugh. Okay, now we're in quadruped. <sighs> quadruped, there's a lot going on. You can do body half, side to side. You can do diagonal patterning where you shift back and shift on the diagonal. That's a great drill for crawling. Make sure you get both diagonal patterns. Yeah, this is one of my favorite uh, ones for like pre-crawling exercises is the weight shifting on the diagonal. Good. What if you just did lower and upper? Let's play with that one. Sit the hips back. So then there's a push from the lower, a pull from the upper. And then you push from the upper and pull with the lower. Push, pull, push, pull. Wherever you decide to put your mind to it, it's kind of interesting. It turns standard exercises and gives it just a little bit more depth. Great, we'll do one more time. Excellent. 
And then I don't think we could go in quadruped without doing cat cow. What would that be? Which pattern is that? Lynn, which pattern is that? <laughs> Head tail, right? So cat cow where we flex the spine, you're pulling the tail and the head in towards your center and reaching the top of your spine up. And then you can unravel into extension, lifting through the tail and the head. All right, rounding through the spine and then extending. What if you played with just moving the tail first, tuck the tail and then round through the rest of the spine? Unravel the tail first and extend through the spine. For those of you that have that access, nice job. It's all about exploring the pattern. How can you move the body in different ways? The same exercise, but how do you move it in different ways? Push pull. Great. Let's see, time check. Wow, we are doing good. Let's do one more. Let's do a transition on from our hands to our elbows or our elbows to our hands. So if we drop the elbow down and then the elbow down, oh gosh, I know one of my gals here is laughing. So we're gonna bring the hand up. Now, in order to bring the hand back underneath you, there needs to be a push, push and a reach. And then a push and a reach, right? Drop down, nice and slow, push and reach, push and reach. Mm -hmm. So you have right and left halves between the two hands. You also have a diagonal pattern going on to support it. So anytime you get rotation, it would be supporting with the opposite hip. When you bring the hand up, the opposite hip supports it and you come up. Nice. I love watching you guys explore these. Great job. Beautiful. All right. I know that was so fast. I hope that gave you a little bit of a dose. I'm going to screen share back one more time and give you guys some concluding thoughts. Feel free to keep exploring on the floor. Um, here we go. All right. So here's the list again, the patterns, breath, core distal, head, tail, upper, lower, body half and cross lateral diagonal. Okay. They build on one another, but they don't necessarily you don't, you don't have to graduate from one to experience the other. It's just helpful if you do. And again, Rachel's going to talk about that in terms of motor development patterns on Saturday. So, um, oh, there we go. These patterns can be applied to any exercise, any position, any time. So when you guys are doing your floor, floor based movements, that was a little bit more demonstrated today, but you can still create or um, you can still create and sense these patterns, even when you're in your chair. So, or even when you're sitting right now, how can you push through your thighs or your feet or anchor your pelvis to give you more reach through the crown of your head, just in posture? Um, I know that it can be challenging to recreate uh, these concepts when they haven't been, been fully demonstrated to you in the context of your body and maybe the exercises that you're doing. So I wanted to list out a few questions that you can ask yourself. And if you guys want to screenshot this or take a picture of it with your phone, you're more than welcome to. So questions that you might ask yourself if you want to integrate and apply, or if you want to apply some of the stuff that you guys learned tonight. So when you're doing your movement or your exercise, which pattern might this movement involve? And if you want to, I can flash up the other, uh, the, the list of patterns as well. And you guys can you know, uh, screenshot that. And then from that pattern, you'll better understand which two areas of the body um, need to be involved. So obviously if it's body halves, then you would say, oh, the right half of the body and the left half of the body. Or if it's upper and lower pattern, it's the upper body and the lower body. 
And then you ask yourselves between the two of those areas, which one is not as obvious to involved or do I tend to neglect in this movement? Maybe when you're crawling, or no, let's say, let's just say quadruped. Let's just say quadruped. Maybe if you're in your quadruped and you're doing a walking drill and you know that's an upper body because that's a push pull from the upper and lower, but maybe you're focused solely on the upper body part and you haven't considered what the lower body should be doing to contribute and support the movement. And then which cues, what cues, which cues, which cues and imagery would help me mentally and physically integrate them, uh, the, these missing, missing pieces into this movement. And kind of the short answer, the cheat sheet of that is push and pull, push off to reach, right? So cues and imagery, you can get creative with, oh, reach for the donut that's hanging over there or, you know, express, expressive imagery, but I think it just boils down to push pull. Um, so full circle, intention doesn't always yield a grossly large movement pattern or a completely new exercise. Um, that is the goal, but it does change how we perceive our participation. It changes the experience. And so um, if the intention is to um, get us just 1% more involved or more integrated, um, changing your intention is how it all starts. And um, I kind of said, okay, my goal tonight is to help you guys get 1% more integrated. And that 1% can easily move to 2% and 5% and 10% and hopefully to a percentage that gets you uh, where you wanna be functionally with your whole, uh, your whole body becoming involved in the movement. Um, I do wanna say, again, I didn't make up these patterns. These are um, patterns that are from Ermgar Bertinieff uh, and her and her system. Um, she, uh, her, one of her students helped uh, synthesize a book called, um, or one of her students synthesized all of her teachings into a book called Making Connections. And so if you super want to nerd out on this stuff, um, Making Connections uh, is a great read. I think you can maybe even find the PDF online for free. Um, it's, it can get a little heady, but from the moment I opened the book, um, I was circling things. I felt it was very, very, very relevant for SCI athletes. And especially if you're an SCI or neuro trainer, it's a great resource. Um, if you don't wanna dive into that one, Theo and I have designated, I think four or five pages in our book, um, just to the Bartinia fundamentals and how they are used in the context of creating movement and integration after SCI. Um, for those of you that have the book, it starts on page 61. And you can get that book, uh, zebrafishneuro.com backslash book. I will say that we are going to have a really nice Black Friday sale. You guys are the first to know that. So if you are have been eyeing the book or are interested in purchasing the book, um, get on our email list so you know when that sale begins and what that how you can access that. Um, and there's my contact information. Feel free to email me with any questions, comments, um, insights that you had from the presentation tonight. Uh, I'm very active on the Zebrafish Neuro Instagram. We post lots of helpful tips, so check that out. And then our website's there. Our next presentation and my last one uh, for the year is on December 8th. It's gonna be a Tuesday this time at 5.30. I'm still structuring the topic of it. So if you guys have a special request, you can email me or Franklin and let us know what you're interested in. Um, I think I'll, that's it for, for me from the presentation, but um, I'll turn it over to Franklin for the Q&A. That's great. Thanks, Stephanie. And um, we're going to do a little bit of uh, sort of Im improv improvisation. We have Theo also, who's been working his tail off, mm -hmm. I noticed. Uh, Theo, um, I went ahead and asked you to unmute yourself. Do you have anything to contribute in terms of how you saw this approach and uh, what was your sort of initial response and reaction to it? Um, well, I can feel my spirals a lot right now. That's a good thing. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know. I, I found this, everything that Stephanie just described and the kind of approach, the larger approach it fits into to really fundamentally change how I thought about movement, which was 
uh, one of the differences was it, it was very mechanistic, uh, for me before I got into the like flowing floor based, um, style. And what that did very immediately was calm my tone down in a really good way so that I, I could actually feel the connections and use the connections I had. So I'm, I'm, I'm still on the floor every morning. Um, not always every night, although tonight's a good night. So I may have started again. Um, and so that's really great. I also think, uh, you know, one of the things uh, I think Stephanie briefly mentioned, but she could, I know, spend a whole, a whole session on is how crucial this style of moving is for redeveloping ownership and for claiming control over the way that you um, choose to move your body, because there isn't a piece of equipment dictating that, uh, or you know, a trainer saying, you know, strapping you into something. Um, it's your responsibility to figure out what shape you want to assume when you're on the floor, and um, the fact that there's no help to get you there on the one hand requires a lot of. Um, you know, it, it, it requires some uh, stability, but because you can just start by like completely laying down, you really don't have to be able to do anything to be able to start. So um, I think that part just really appeals to me because it is, you know, if you can get on a flat surface, it is the most accessible thing um, to start with the, the very, very basics. Um, and uh, that's the foundation for a lot of uh, wonderful development. Okay. Um, so interesting. Thanks, Steph. That was you great. Know, you say that, uh, Theo, because one of the questions that we had from one of the participants was that how could this be uh, sort of emulated on a bed surface? Um, did you ever try that, Theo, or, uh, or between the two of you, Stephanie and Theo, any suggestions? That was one of the questions that has been posed. Yeah. So, um, you can certainly do all of this work on a bed. Um, the one thing with, I mean, if that's your option, I'd rather you work on the bed than nothing. The thing with um, the bed is that it's squishy. And so it doesn't give you that platform to be able to push off of. As some of you guys know, it's really hard to roll over in a really soft bed. So it's that's because when you push against it, it gives way and it doesn't give you that stability and that foundation to give you the push off for reach. So of course, yes, do it on the bed if that's your option. If you do have the ability to get on a more firm surface or maybe you put some mats on top of your bed that make it more firm, uh, that would be a better option. I know Rachel's gonna be doing her presentation, I think uh, is gonna be talking more about this application in, the bed, in like a bed environment, yeah. Okay, great. All right, next question. Um, on this stomach movement, if a person cannot pull their legs towards their body, is it better to have a person pull their own leg, as mentioned, or have a trainer assist while a person thinks about the intention? Uh, um, I would say there's there's room for both in that. As Theo mentioned, this is the per this is a great place for you to explore what your body is able to do without a trainer and without any help. So take advantage of that opportunity. Don't be so fixated on um, the movements that you want to do, but need an, a trainer to achieve them. Focus on what you can do without a trainer. And then after that, um, you can have a trainer assist you in the movement. Um, that, that assistance helps you feel the shape and the movement of the bones that may give you a better picture down the line of how to do that on your own. But initially, I would say focus on what you can create in your body without a trainer. Okay, um, there are two questions. I'm gonna combine them into one. Uh, one person is a C6, the other person is a C7, T1. Um, basically, from both of them, they were sort of expressing enthusiasm, excitement, yet frustration because they just cannot see doing any of the things that you showed. Where do they start? So um, as Theo mentioned, the Best part about floor-based movement, you know, once you're on the floor or once you're on the bed, if you're laying on your back, that's where you start. So I'm assuming they can at least lay on your back. And I know that doesn't seem like much, but again, it's the 1% that's gonna inch you closer to where you wanna go. Um, if, if this feels so, so completely overwhelming to you, then maybe visiting some 
personal sessions might be helpful to get you started. Um, and we can we can explore that together too, just to make it a little bit more clear where you'll go from the laying on your back uh, exercises. But start with those first five, the breath on your back, the arms reaching on your back, the side bending on your back, and then the extension. Yeah. Okay. Good advice. We call that the wiggle. We call that the wiggle. Just wiggle, get on the floor and wiggle. <laughs> Whatever <laughs> wiggling you can do. Yeah. I think your your message is that start small, go go for sort of low hanging fruit, accomplish, and just sort of work your way up. Yeah, you got to start somewhere. If you think if you're if you're thinking like, oh my god, I have to be able to do gait training in order to do recovery or to progress in my movement, that's not that couldn't be further from the truth. That's too far away right now. Don't think about that. We're all at home anyways. That's kind of not really an option. So start small and, and then get yourself prepared so that when that opportunity does come that you can work with a trainer, you're ready, your body's ready for that. Great advice. Okay, next question. In quadruped, when you were coming from forearm up to hands, I saw the push, but not sure of where was the reach. Oh, okay, okay. Um, can you guys all see me okay? Yeah. Okay, so let's do it from here. So if I'm gonna, on my elbows, I'm gonna push from the floor here and my shoulder is gonna reach. So it could be like this. It could be this motion even, reach. But instead of reaching out to the side, I'm just reaching enough so that I can put the hand down. Does that make sense? So, so push from this side, reach with the shoulder and then hand down. Okay, I hope that clarifies. All right. Next question, um, have you ever used a balanced body MOTR machine in your therapies? Is that yeah, it? yes. Oh, that's exciting, that's very niche. I don't um, know what that is, so why don't you explain it, what it does? Yeah, so basically a motor, uh, I think it's moving on the roller, is MOTR. Basically it's a foam roller. Uh, the founder, I actually know the founder quite well. The, the way she created it was she put a foam roller with a T stick across the top and two retractable dog leashes on, on the stick. So basically there's like these like retractable kind of resistance uh, cables uh, attached to a foam roller. Um, so to answer your question, have I ever used them? Uh, I have not actually used a motor with SCI athletes, but I've used things that basically are that um with the reformer and the um just resistance bands on a trap table using the roller yeah um you can recreate that the last lecture that we did we talked about putting resistance bands in a door frame you can also recreate that uh environment um putting the resistance band in door frame and then laying on the roller okay all right next question how much time a day is recommended to do floor-based movements you can do like 15 minutes a day, that'd be great. If it's hard to get on the floor, do larger chunks of time, uh, you know, fewer days a week. Um, as Theo mentioned, he tries to get on the floor morning and night. So basically it's a way to wake him up and then it's a way to relax his body and his tone so that he can sleep better at night. Um, everyone's different. So figuring out, you know, how much movement do you need for your body? How much tone do you have that you need to stretch out? If you're sitting in a chair or sitting all day, just know that your body's gonna to conform to that shape. And so giving your body an opportunity to be unconstrained through floor-based movement is a nice way to go to help you stretch out. Okay, alrighty. Um, so you mentioned on Saturday, Rachel is gonna be doing a session. And by the way, everyone, her session is gonna be at 11 o'clock California time. Uh, obviously you can still sign up to, to take part of it and the title of it is getting horizontal to get vertical and it's basically kind of bed based uh, floor and bed based movement so um, explain again um, Stephanie how does um, how does what you just showed us sort of correlate to what Rachel is going to do on Saturday yeah so um, I didn't mention this in my presentation but the Bartenia fundamentals correlate very uh, well with motor development patterns. So the patterns that the baby that a baby goes through the stages that a baby goes through as they're learning to roll over, um, crawl, or sit up, crawl, pull their self up to a standing position and then walk. 
And um, I mentioned tummy time is one of the motor development phases, and that correlates to the head tail pattern of the Bartenieff patterns. And so each of the motor development patterns has um, a, uh, a prime, you could say a primary one or two patterns of the Bartenieff. And so I believe Rachel's on here, maybe she can speak more to that, but I believe she's going to be talking about the motor development progression and then touching on how the Bartenieff patterns sort of parallel that. Yep. And speaking of the devil, Rachel is on with us. This is, this looks almost staged, right? All these people that are popping in, but it's not everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, Steph, that was a great explanation. Um, I'll just be pulling in the motor development stages of a baby a little bit more kind of um, in meshing with uh, the Bartinia fundamentals that Steph just talked about. Um, and then we'll be doing some floor slash bed based movement. I'll have a, um, a good friend here with me. So I'll also be able to show some spotting for folks who maybe need someone to assist them, but that person might not know how to move around them. So um, yeah, that will be available for people too, if they need it. Outstanding. Uh, I tell you people, you know, I feel so blessed and fortunate to, to be living here and to have come across and met people like Stephanie and Rachel. Um, when I talk to some of my colleagues across the country, they are very <laughs> uh, jealous of, um, of the kind of access that we have to, to the types of people like Stephanie and Rachel who, who can relate to individuals with spinal cord injury and bring really truly innovative and outside the box thinking and approaches to, um, to, to helping increasing the amount of recovery and movement. So um, thanks. Stephanie, thanks, Rachel, for, for being who you are and, and, and working with NorCal CI. So that brings to a conclusion tonight's presentation. As I mentioned, um, everything was recorded, so we'll send you a recording. I know Steph Stephanie shared with you a lot of stuff. Uh, sometimes might have been a little too complicated, but you know, watch the recording multiple times if you have to, and, uh, and you'll get the hang of it. So we'll send that to you on Monday morning. It'll be in your inboxes. And again, uh, make sure you register for Rachel's class on Saturday at 11 o'clock uh, California time. Uh, thanks again, Stephanie. Good seeing you all um, and have a good night, uh, everyone. Bye-bye.